Üdv és jó estét! Én Papréka Kinga vagyok, az Eurozin főszerkesztője. Ez egy bécsi székhelyű online magazin és 90 európai lap hálózata. Az idei konferenciánkat Budapestre terveztük, és hát Budapesten is tartjuk, de erős megszorításokkal, úgyhogy most online találkozunk, amelyet a Partizan a partnerségben tudunk megvalósítani. Itt most a beszélgetésben maszkot fogunk hordani, belátható okokból, és két beszélgető partnerünk online csatlakozik hozzánk. A beszélgetés angolul zajlik majd, de magyar feliratokkal, úgyhogy senki ne essen kétségbe, csak olvasson. És kíváncsiak vagyunk a kérdésekre és a kommentárokra is, itt az élőadás alatt, illetve a Jurazin Facebook oldalán is lehet kommentelni, és ezekre reagálni fogunk egy élő videokonferenciában. Jó szórakozást! Welcome, thanks for taking the time and being here with us. So our conversation partners, or, you know, my conversation partners, because my colleagues couldn't come from Vienna because of the lockdown, are, uh, let's just go in alphabetical order, I guess. Um, Lukas Fila from Bratislava, I believe. That's correct. Uh, Andres Földes from Budapest. Hello. Anna Lengyel, also from Budapest. Hi there. And Boris Veziak from Maribor. Hello. Lukas Fila is the CEO and co-founder of Genik N, one of Slovakia's leading independent media platforms. He started as a political reporter, later becoming project manager, marketing director, and finally, deputy editor-in-chief at the Daily SME. In 2014, he left SME, along with nearly 50 colleagues, soon to launch Genik N. Andres Földes is a journalist and videographer focusing on humanitarian and ecological issues. After working for 20 years at Index.hu, he resigned along with over 80 colleagues this summer to then become one of Telex's founding journalists. Anna Lengyel is an award-winning dramaturg and literary translator, director of Panodrama, the only documentary theater in Hungary. She has worked with Pina Bausch and Robert Wilson and remains a close collaborator of renowned Hungarian directors Arpad Schilling, Robert Olföldi and Tomás Osse. Boris Veziak is an associate professor of philosophy at the Faculty of Arts of the University of Maribor, Slovenia. His professional interests include the history of philosophy, discourse theory, media analysis, and the theory of argumentation. Today, I asked you to, to talk with us about the professional autonomy that you maintain or how you maintain professional autonomy and how you see yourself as journalists, as uh, artists and as an academic uh, now grappling with pretty tight political situations. Of course, there's huge differences between the Slovakian and the Slovenian political scene, although not that big differences between the Slovenian and the Hungarian, at least in terms of, you know, central willpower. But let's, um, let's just go a quick round and please explain to me, all of you, how you see yourself now professionally. Do you see your autonomy and your freedom to act according to your best understanding threatened in any way? And does the institution that you work with or any institution you work with face any kind of pressure? To be a, an independent journalist in Hungary is quite a challenging task, I would say. Uh, I personally uh, felt uh, the pressure of the of the current political system when uh, the, when my my media called Index that AGU had been pressured into a level by uh, by by different uh, organization uh, and people close to the government. So it was pressured until a point that we like all of the journalists had left uh, the media because we didn't feel that we can uh, continue to work freely uh, under these circumstances. And we started a new media and we are trying to be independent by a way that we, we get donations only from the readers. So we see this is the only option now in Hungary to, to maintain uh, uh, an independent journalistic work. So basically, I think this tells everything about how to be 
an independent journalist in Hungary. Just to be very precise, uh, the pressure you faced did not come from indirect authority, but through ownership, right? So, so the owner of the pap paper or the medium uh, started to intervene in your operations, right? Well, you know, uh, the, the pressure is quite a uh, tricky one in, in, uh, in Eastern Europe. So that's why it's really uh, difficult to, to explain to a Westerner, for example. So pressure is, is not like policemen come into the editorial room and beat us with, with sticks, like, you know, everyone uh, would imagine uh, such, a, such a pressure or, you know, direct phones. So it's always a tricky one. Many Hungarian newspapers had been either uh, shut down or turned to a government mouthpiece, and none of them had been uh, witnessed any really obvious pressure so it's always a tricky you 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 find yourself in a in a tricky construction where you just realize it's harder and harder to to work freely and it's i if if you're not a hungarian it's really hard and quite uh, long to describe this whole structure but basically there are uh, personal elements of these um, of this structure. So for example, some uh, advisors arrive to our company and tell us how to reorganize uh, or, or editorial structure to be more effective while we were quite effective and we were the biggest uh, media. So it was a funny thing to have advisors from smaller medias to tell us how to work. And also there are uh, pressure, there were pressure from the, from economical si uh, sides. And also we, we had a, a very, uh, well, I would say bad contract uh, with a, with a, uh, um, media press house who sold our advertisement and uh, they uh, pressured us. So there were many ways and it's really hard to point out that who did, you know, the last step that made us leave. But uh, if you are not really familiar with the Hungarian uh, uh, media landscape, it's, it's a it's a very interesting thing to see all of the media uh, that has changed either or shut down or had been shut down were from the non-governmental side and they turned to a, a, a pro-government media or they become smaller and they try to uh, find another way to be independent. So, so none of the pro-government media or right-wing media uh, faced such pressure. So sure. from a distance, this tells, you know, the whole story. Also, should you be interested in more details about this? And honestly, you should be. There's going to be further reads down in the description, which Andres recommends for those who want to get more familiar with the media situation in Hungary. Anna, please tell me about what you're facing. We are recording this discussion, this part of the discussion, a week in advance. And there's a bunch of new corona regulations which just came out a few hours ago, which seem to affect your work professionally, not only in terms of how theaters um, and artists, with performing artists, uh, are being concerned with political pressure anyway, but it also puts you in a very uncertain situation. Can you tell us about that, please? Well, um, it's a very complex situation, and um, I think you can draw a parallel uh, between how this government treats um, the cultural um, uh, players or uh, stakeholders um, uh, otherwise, and how they treat us now in the corona situation. Um, if you look at Germany, for instance, um, back in March, very early on, 
the German government uh, closed down the theaters for a while. But um, a week later, or a few days later, actually, they uh, um, injected um, a capital of five million euros into the culture scene. This meant effectively that um, any actor or other um, collaborator of the Schaubühne in Berlin or the Thalia Theater in Hamburg, and I could go on, uh, ended up getting 90% of their um, salaries uh, in, the whole, in this whole uh, period. And uh, it was in the case of the Schaubühne, for instance, it was 60% uh, from Berlin, from the Senate, and 30% from the Schaubühne. So um, in our country, they closed down the theaters and uh, we got almost nearly nothing, no financial help. There were a few very, um, you know, they were like arms, then they were like really pitiful, um, ridiculous amounts of money you could apply for, but they were um, mostly uh, ideologically uh, founded. So you had to apply with a project about uh, the 100th hundred, uh, hundred, uh, anniversary or the centennial of the Trianon decision, for instance, and stuff like that. Um, what happened now is that um, while uh, Angela Merkel, when, he when she announced um, new regulations for the whole country, she made an announcement on a Thursday and the uh, regulations uh, uh, started on the Monday. Now, in this country, Viktor Orban made an announcement at 7 p.m. and regulations started at 12, so five hours later. And in the theater, you, you can't... You can only uh, have people sitting on every third seat. If he had consulted anyone at all in, the, uh, in our profession, then he would have found out that about 90% of theatergoers go to the theater in couples with uh, someone that they live in the same household with. So it makes absolutely no sense. You know, they want to sit together. If they risk going to the theater, if they wear a mask, if they do all of that, despite all of that, they end up going to the theater. And then they are told at the gate that you can't sit with your loved one who you are living with in the same flat from, you know, noon to morning till uh, night. Then they might turn, turn around and walk home anyway. So that's... So it's going to be even louder with the candy candy sackets, which they have to crunch anyway during the whole show. No, have to they don't do that. I'm just kidding. Nah, that's, that's However, really, there's, there's but something. That's just, but I think that's just really one thing, because uh, I think it's important that we talk about um, the, the general situation as well, um, briefly. In uh, just going back to 2006, when uh, Fidesz won um, the elections uh, uh, in the country or the local elections, so not the national, they lost the national elections, but then, then came the scandal with Yu Chang's uh, speech, and then they won a landslide victory all over the country, even in Budapest, in most places. And in the country, they quickly replaced uh, all theater directors in all of the state and city theaters. And with uh, maybe two exceptions, they ended up uh, being completely incompetent buffoons who are just really the cronies of the government and, and they, don't, they are completely incompetent. So they might sell out because they do some cheap kind of you know, shows and musicals and whatnot. But it's not, it has nothing to do with quality art, quality theater. And then in 2010, they won the national elections as well. And with a few exceptions, a few notable exceptions, like Katonerz of Theater, Erkin and Radnoti in the um, capital, they also replaced the directors uh, in the capital. And the independent scene, the independent theater scene, which I am a representative of, I run an independent theater, is very important in Hungary. About uh, between eight and nine invitations to major international festivals come to the independent scene rather than the state or city theater scene. Uh, and there are many players, many really well-known names from Arpad Schilling to Cornel Mundruzzo and many others who are, and Victor Bodo, who keep being asked to work uh, abroad in the best houses. Um, and, but they are tricky because many, and this is, uh, I think, uh, relates also to uh, 
what's been previously said that many in abroad think there is a direct censorship. No, they are cleverer than that. So they are, since uh, 2010, they have been trying to bleed out the independent scene. So they are, we are getting less and less money, but they don't say, no, this show is uh, uh, banned or whatever. So they are trickier than that. And it's becoming increasingly difficult to survive um, in these situations. And then almost a year ago, last December, they tried to pass a bill that would have changed uh, the whole structure. They would have uh, defunded the independent scene. At least the uh, annual funding would have been uh, would have ceased. And uh, they wanted to basically just um, erase the major uh, production uh, funding uh, body, the National Cultural Fund. And they wanted to interfere with um, appointing directors into uh, theaters which are uh, commonly owned by uh, uh, cities and uh, the, uh, the government or the nation or whatever. And there was a huge protest, which I was one of uh, the main organizers of, and um, more than you know, 13,000 or maybe more people showed up and many well-known names and all of that. So it was very successful and they withdrew two of their plans out of the three, but they still had now have a word in uh, appointing directors, which ended up, uh, so, so in the end, Budapest took over three theaters entirely, which is very problematic because now they don't have to, we have an opposition um, government in Budapest, led by Gergely Karacsony, the new mayor. So they, these theaters are safe for now, but it ended up having, you know, there are some national theaters or theaters run or funded by the government and some by the city. And this is not how it should be. It should be a mixed funding. That's the healthy thing. That's what happens all over the world. And also there's a culture of fragmentation. Well, there is that as well. And then everyone knows about the theater, um, about the University and of Theater and Film Arts. That's the official name where I'm a, both a doctoral student and a guest lecturer um, regularly. And as you know, we refuse to um, let these uh, the clowns new, the new, take the over. The new government appointed so leadership, the, right? Yes, they, they completely restructured the whole thing. They passed a new law, uh, which, would, uh, which gave, th this was of course funded by the government and now it's uh, given over to a board of trustees and they appointed five men. Typically, they would never think of appointing a woman. Uh, uh, two so-called theater experts, one so-called film expert, and two oil refinery <laughs> experts. Oh. And uh, and uh, but but we uh, we are resisting. We have resisted since the first of September. There is a blockade of the buildings, as you know. And I must say, this is the most uplifting experience. Uh, it's been the most uplifting experience for a long, long time right next to when you guys stood up and refused mm -hmm. to be bullied. This was, this was um, two parallel stories. These were two parallel stories which have been occupying the publicity in Hungary and I think also in, in the region about Hungary since at least the middle of the summer. And um, maybe we can look for something even, even um, more <laughs> depressing uh, when we talk about Slovenia, or I don't know, Boris, it's, it's yours to judge whether you would say that the situation is any better or worse in Slovenia, which has entered a track of rapid urbanization since the beginning of the year, since uh, Janez Janic came back to power, um, being openly sort of taking after the Hungarian rule. Please tell us about your situation. How do you see yourself as, a, as an academic, as a public intellectual, as a writer? Um, what kind of pressure do you face? How do you see um, autonomy of opinion and publishing in Slovenia right now? Okay, let me first present myself. Um, I'm a modest philosopher by profession. Uh, I teach at the University of Maribor in Slovenia. So, professionally speaking, I mostly do research in the field of history philosophy. Uh, partly I'm interested in argumentation, also in media analysis. For example, I teach several subjects on media. 
And what I try to do also is to be an active citizen besides my occupation. Um, so I'm trying to be a public intellectual, as you said, and in that sense, I sp spontaneously became more involved in media matters in my country. Uh, more and more a sort of critical reader of Slovene journals and digital media, commenting them also on my web blog. Um, uh, I'm not paid, I have no sponsors and no institutional supporters. So currently I have more than 15 years of such experience and since the beginning I have published more than let's say 2,000 posts or comments. Um, what I did so far, I guess, can be described as a sort of monitoring of media developments here in Slovenia. I try to observe and comment political and economic interven interventions into our media landscape. Well, I mostly criticize media for being too passive and too lazy. Uh, while being subject to direct political pressure. Uh, besides, I analyze media narratives and arguments, the ways how they approach to different topics. I blame them for losing their autonomy, and I'm certainly very much hated person for doing that. Uh, a part of my interest is also media language analysis, including the language of hate and political propaganda and the ways or methods how media present or even legitimize such agendas. Um, okay, I was asked to say something about the ways how I experience political pressure here in Slovenia, about tactics and professional standards concerning uh, uh, independent publishing and so on. Uh, I would say the following, uh, a big dramatic change happened basically this year. Uh, Janis Janša, who is a Slovenian version of Viktor Orban, succeeded in becoming prime minister after winning the elections in 2018 with his party and then being unable to form the ruling coalition till March this year. So um, his victory in 2018 was more um, a result of harsh rhetoric based on xenophobia, Islamophobia and hate speech, which was characteristic for his campaign. And as you can imagine, right wing ruling party here in Slovenia is now using the pandemic to restrict rights and freedoms also um, uh, promoting or sparking the current weekly protest in the streets. So we are now witnessing the, let's say, introduction of legal and financial restrictions towards NGOs, also independent cultural sector and the media. Um, and as a professor, I must mention my suspicion uh, namely, we all expect that the new government, which is, as I said, Orban's ally, will also try to control or, let's say, subjugate somehow our universities, uh, following partly the Hungarian example. So far, this has not happened, so we will see what is yet to come. And that would be my introduction. Yeah, thank you. Just uh, to give an example for how very direct this allyship is, the very beginning of October, the Hungarian media company TV2, that's TV2 in mirror translation, acquired the third largest outlet, Planet TV, in Slovenia and is now um, under the control of an organization that is a direct mouthpiece to the Hungarian government. So it seems like there's some expansion of this model here, but not only this model is expanding, there's, um, there's something brighter happening in Slovakia and it's been happening for a while. So let's ask Lukash, first of all, whether he sees this any brighter. I mean, you know, in comparison, it may seem rather nice. But Lukash, would you care to tell us about Genik N's situation right now? Um, an outlet that is born out of um, a pretty similar situation that Andres faced. 
actually a yes. much earlier phase of what Andres faced lately. And you are expanding to Czechia too. Yes, uh, thank you for, for having me. Um, as you mentioned, I think the story um, uh, of Denigan is very similar to, to the story of, of uh, Telex. Uh, but uh, six years uh, older. Um, the the social and political situation in Slovakia is somewhat different and has been different for, for a number of years. So uh, the political power is not as um, mm, as ideological, as strong and um, as uh, um, powerful in, in overall decision making, and it's therefore not the only problem of the media, or, or the, the problems are the pressures are split, I think, uh, and have been for for a longer period. I mean, they're split between the political pressures and the political power and the interests of, of the oligarchs. So we we for the last. Um, Mm, over 10 years, so we're seeing an increase of influence of, of uh, oligarchs in the media who were not directly controlled by politicians, but which had their own interests and again, uh, mostly wanted to own media in order to uh, be able to exert leverage over uh, politicians and just uh, defend their interests. So the um, the situation is uh, is different in uh, this regard. The, the political power the power is not as heavily centralized and never was. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, all of us were working uh, in a newspaper which um, uh, which had a new 50% owner, uh, which was one of the major oligarchic groups in the country, and we decided to leave. Uh, at that point and start started doing again from the beginning we we were building it as mainly a subscription based medium that means that we are also doing a print uh, daily newspaper we do have advertisement and and all the other traditional sources of revenue but the primary focus has always been on digital subscription we are for fortunate enough to now have over 60,000 uh, subscribers which is uh, an excellent result, I think, for for any uh, any market in any country. But given Slovakia's size of five million, I think that's a really an outstanding result, and that is uh, more than enough to be uh, self sufficient. Also, Slovakia, after some time of, uh, of political turbulence, after uh, the killing of a journalist, which is something that is um, unprecedented in the wider region. Uh, got on track uh, uh, to something better uh, politically speaking. So I think now the political climate in Slovakia is uh, okay in terms of the freedoms of speech. I think uh, media are not uh, facing any direct uh, political pressure. So I would say by comparison, this situation, the political uh, dimension has improved uh, significantly over the last couple of years, first with presidential elections and then with uh, parliamentary elections. And uh, in terms of the oligarchs, I think since a lot of um, uh, big uh, scandals of the past are now being investigated. I think even the oligarchs are not mm, no longer certain uh, of, of their position and their situation. So we will see how that develops because one trend that continues uh, uh, to occur is that very few foreign investors are interested in investing in the media. So basically, it's up uh, to local investors, local businessmen and, and local journalists to to own and run the media houses. And uh, until recently, it's been mostly the oligarchs that were interested in investing. Uh, but we'll see how that develops. If there is a strong push to clear uh, the public sphere, not in terms of, of, of politicians and, and judges, but also of, of the businessmen and the various interests that are that sometimes hide behind the the elected um, officials. I think we might see an an overall improvement in terms of the uh, media landscape, but uh, we'll see how that goes. It can turn out. Uh, just the other way around, we we can we may see that uh, the oligarchs, in order to hold on uh, to whatever influence they have left, will be even more tempted to to enter the media landscape. So we'll see how that goes. As you mentioned, our improving situation I, uh, after roughly two and a half years of operations, we um, started making a profit. 
and uh, I and I think we were being watched by investors and journalists in the region, and we were approached by a group of of uh, Czech investors whether we would be interested in partnering and starting starting something similar as Denik N in the Czech Republic. In the end, it's not only similar; it's uh, it's uh, extremely close. So we it it has a similar or uh, nearly identical brand. The entire concept they have one less is uh, very right. right? Yes, because Denik it's uh, it means daily, and you just spell it differently in Slovak and in Czech. So the one n, the one missing n is that's just a matter of grammar. But it shows you how close uh, you know Czech and Slovak are, and uh, even the uh, mentalities. I think in many respects. So that I think that's why why it it works as well as it does because we now have a hundred people working in Slovakia, roughly speaking, and in the Czech Republic they have a completely separate um, publishing house and an editorial room of, of roughly 50 people uh, and uh, they basically run their own show. I mean, we help them with the strategic things and they run on our technology. But in terms of content, it's uh, it's uh, there is a local local team that does uh, their own thing and. Uh, even though uh, many people were skeptical in the Czech Republic in terms of the Czechs being willing to pay for uh, online content, uh, luckily it doesn't seem to be the case that there there would be any sort of a problem in this regard. So they're approaching um, 20,000 subscribers uh, in the Czech Republic, which is uh, exactly on the trajectory that we projected when they started, which is now uh, just uh, over two years ago. So they're doing um, uh, very well also. And uh, and I, I hope it, it gives some optimism on various levels that shows that you can have an independent media house uh, which can be self-sustainable and can operate in, in the long run. It's not dependent on grants, on sponsorship money and so on and so on. Uh, but is able to make its own money and thereby ensure its independence. And it shows that there are enough people that appreciate quality content and are willing to to pay for it, I think, because that's what the business model is based on. It's a great business model because it not only ensures independence, but it it uh, there is a, a great drive uh, towards quality because you find that uh, be, be the, the articles uh, that people are most willing to pay for uh, are the ones that are that bring the highest added value that that represent the best uh, journalism. So I think it's uh, one of the rare occasions where uh, the commercial forces actually are, are a force for a higher quality and higher public uh, intro, interest journalism. That is indeed a quite a peculiar part of the story because the industry belief has throughout commercialization of media, I would say, uh, but especially in the past, say, 15 to 20 years, what digitization has been that it's just impossible to expect the users to pay, right? Should it be readers or viewers or whatnot? Uh, also, people still paying for television didn't quite interfere with this idea. And yet, Yeniken is considered a bit of an industry wonder specifically because you went against this this mainstream and proved this wrong or prove prove something else possible on a pretty small media market. At least that's, you know, this has been a complaint I have heard often from colleagues in, in Central and Eastern Europe uh, that our markets are too small. The state is always going to be a major player. You are never going to sustain yourself from uh, from your readers only. What do you think about this? Is this something, is this uh, sort of a, a learned, um, learned attitude or is there something to it? Would more papers, for instance, in Slovakia be able to sustain themselves this way or is there a limit on this? Well, first of all, I think now you see an overall trend in people being willing to pay for online content. It's not only journalism, but it's also Netflix, Spotify, whatever. I mean, it's just it's becoming normal again to pay for content. I think you have the old generation of people who were used to uh, buying uh, newspapers on the stand. So it's it, it's normal for them to be paying um, for content. I think you have a, a new generation now growing up that in the last five years, it's become 
it's certainly absolutely normal to be to be paying for movies for music i don't i think uh illegal downloading yeah, is yeah. is a phenomenon of the past so there is just this middle generation that sort of was spoiled by the 90s where uh, content um online was free or, or, or it was, uh, you know, you could, you could, you could have pirate versions or, or whatever. But I think that was sort of the exception. And now we're again coming to the normal, which has been established in the media industry for decades or for hundreds of years, but when it was usual to pay, you know, um, your money for, for your newspaper. So I don't think we're going against any uh, major trends. I think we're going perfectly in line with with uh, global trends that concern not only the media industry but uh, you know the en- entertainment uh, industry in general the question of the, of whether people are willing to pay i think that's something that is no longer even a valid question i would say in terms of, of the region if you see uh, the number of people that are paying for our content and uh, even for the content of some of our competitors in Slovakia, if you look at the numbers of, of the Czech sub- subscribers who are, the numbers are growing in a very similar way as they were growing in, in Slovakia, despite the story being completely different because we were, again, we were being told like, okay, well, the first problem is that the Czechs are never going to pay for content. And the other problem is that they don't have, you don't have a strong story in the Czech Republic as you had in Slovakia, like of, of journalists is uh, standing up and revolting. And again, the Czech Republic has its many media problems. So there was a clear need for a deeper need for for an independent outlet such as as ours. But yes, you did not have like this one uh, significant event that would uh, electrify people. And still the number of subscribers is growing pretty much the same as it was here on on a somewhat larger market, but, but, but still. And again, if you look at the number of people that now supported Telex or even supported many of the donation campaigns uh, that that were going on previously in Hungary, again, you see a big number of normal, regular people willing to pay, you know, their few um, forints for for supporting quality journalism. A donation is something uh, a slight, slightly different from a subscription, but the basic principle of of the of of, of a mass of people realizing, okay, it, I have to pay, or there will be no free speech in my country. I think that's that's the same. So I I don't think uh, you can really. Uh, with a straight face say that no people are never going to pay for content and you cannot uh, sustain a medium. I mean, we can discuss why some of the projects maybe came too early, some of them maybe did not find the right way of, of, of uh, the right content or the right way of, of um, approaching people. But overall, I would say it is a settled question that it can be done and it can be done on our markets, which all have their nuances maybe, but basically are similar the question is uh, how to do it who will do it and yet somewhere in the future there is a question of uh, how many similar media can survive but i don't think you can you know uh, at this time uh, say a definite uh, answer because i think people are going to be more and more accustomed to the fact that it, it is necessary to pay so i think you will see uh, an, a huge expansion of the total um group of people that are potential customers because whereas now it's in the tens of thousands it's going to very soon be in the hundred thousands and so on so just uh, digital progress within our societies is going to increase the targets tar- target groups massively and with that i i think you will also have more and more room for a different type of of uh, of media and journalists to make, uh, money on a digital subscription Although I do think that there might be certain genres where the the market logic doesn't apply or doesn't apply the same way. Ona, you have mentioned, which is, you know, the recurring story in political oppression. Now, it's not the big black car and the red phone. It's usually bleeding out institutions or whole spheres of culture economically, which, well, in capitalism, there are tools for everyone um, who can afford them. What do you think would be some kind of a miracle solution, for instance, for independent theater. Let's talk about theater here because you have a pretty vast knowledge of of the context and also are sustaining a, an institution yourself. 
Well, um, to be honest, I must say I'm really, really pissed off at uh, the Hungarian public in general. I mean, not the theater going public, but citizens. I keep saying, come on, there are no tanks on the streets. They won't imprison you if you open your mouth. Certainly no one's going to execute you. So if you compare it to the 50s or the 60s or even the 70s, the worst thing that can happen if you open your mouth, if you're critical of this government, very critical even, is that you lose your job, that can happen, and you lose your funding, or you won't be, if you apply for a grant, you won't get it. Certainly that can happen. And I always say, I can also get trolls. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, that's another different story. Yes, but, um, you know, I always say, people with small children, I, I can't judge. I don't have small children or any children, um, as a matter of fact. So I refrain from passing judgment there. But people who are only responsible for themselves or their partners, you know, people, adults with uh, university degrees, with the knowledge of at least one language or several, and I know many, 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 I really don't see the reason why they should fear you know, the way they should fear anything, the way they should fear speaking up, standing up, why they should tell me, oh, I can't, I can't open my mouth because then I'll lose my job and I existentially, I can't afford it. And I say, come on, you speak German, you speak English, you have two degrees. What the hell? You, maybe you won't have a steady job with a pension in sight, which is going to be worth nothing anyway in, you know, 20, 30 years, but you'll get jobs. This is an international market now. So you can certainly, you know, work uh, from Hungary to abroad. You can travel around once we have conquered COVID and it go, goes back we'll to see, normal. Now people are we'll talking see about, about that. Schengen, but, yeah. but, but, but I'm really, really pissed off at people who are behaving uh, uh, like cowards, I'm sorry to say, you know. Um, so there is, for instance, a depressingly huge amount of self-censorship going on. So that the government doesn't even need to censor you because you're censoring yourself before they would get there. And that really pisses me off. Sorry, this is not very, um, maybe it's, it's a it's word that's still okay. Maybe. Anyway, so in, in effect, um, one thing that I don't think we can hope for salvation from the European Union. I think there is one point that they, where they should be a million times stricter and that is when they fund EU funding going anywhere, there should be a very strict accounting for that. So if I get EU funding, and I have gotten very, as we've been very successful sometimes with EU fundings, you cannot imagine the kind of uh, uh, bookkeeping that I have to do. It's like this huge Excel table with the, the pettiest of details of, you know, like license plate numbers of the cars w in which we traveled uh, 50 kilometers and spent, I don't know, like 5,000 forints. So then how at the same time can it happen that they fund huge efforts of this government that have nothing to show for it? There is simply nothing there. So in that respect, I think they should be stricter. But other than that, I think we should hope for any salvation from ourselves. We should speak up. We should feel free. And I think they are, in the end, this government, Orban and company, I think they are cowards. So once there are 100,000 people on the street, because the moron is trying to tax the internet because he doesn't know what it's good for. He has only heard of, you know, Googling and emailing and he... Never, he doesn't realize the data amount that streaming, for instance, would cause. And so he tries to uh, 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 introduce a special tax on the Internet. And suddenly there are 100,000 people out on the streets. And right away, he withdraws, you know. So I think they are cowards. And I think if we open our mouths and we're not afraid, then it's going to be the long-term long solution for everything, for freedom in the arts, freedom in the press. So we should just so, so arise as a nation and refuse to be <laughs> bullied. So you think the confrontation pays off in the long run and you are willing to take risks for Absolutely. the long run, right? Absolutely. Is, is it that, and it's more a personal impression, I, you know, studying a bit of history, I always have the impression that we rise up just after the moment 
it goes hopeless. <laughs> of course, it's a cultural perception and it has a lot to do with Hungarians loving to yammer about a Hungarian. So yeah. of course, I'm guilty of yeah. that too. But is it the difference of boiling point where you reach the point when you say it's enough and I'm not putting up with this, it's not worth putting up with this, it's not worth conforming to the circumstances? Because exactly as Andres also said, there's always a whole intricate machinery of interference. Is it that you take issue earlier and other people take issue later? Or do you think that some, a huge portion of society just doesn't take issue? Um, of I, course, we're, we're a little bit guessing here about yeah. talking about the culture. I think in a way there is no sudden boiling point. So there isn't like this one thing which would really light the fuse. They are trickier than that, so they are going step by step. But on the other hand, we are living in a country of 1984, where people are, you know, they, they, they what, what is happening in their lives very often is that they go hungry every single day. And if the school closes because of COVID, then the children don't get to eat. That even today, leading news every single time, they found, I don't know, 64 migrants <laughs> on the border of something like, I don't know, Hungary and Serbia or whatever. coming back from Gastar by... Yeah, Gastar funnily, by they are Germany. wearing... If, if, they, if, you, if they provide a picture, then you can see that they are wearing summer clothes. So that's another story. But anyway, so, so there is this split conscience of people believing what they are being told rather than what they are experiences. I don't know if there is a tipping point or a boiling point that would change that. I, I think people, well, in the end, it all boils down to education. So uh, I always say if there is one, one area that we should just get back from, from these people right away, it's public education, because in the end, it all boils down to public education. Because if you don't learn how to read uh, sources critically. If you don't, you know, if you read something and you don't think of checking, okay, but what is the site? Who is writing this? Is this uh, valid? Is this legitimate? Have you heard of it? Or is it just some, you know, this is even with all the all the fake news about no virus being there and wearing a mask is a bad idea and stuff like that. So we just have to learn to read cr critically. We have to go to the schools. We We have to, I think maybe we should find a way to become involved in public education, all of us, informally, formally, I don't know how, but I think that's the key to our future. Well, in, in a state of this level of media capture, I think you have to do critical reading with every breath because you're actually going against everything that's coming, coming toward you and you have to find more credible sources for yourself. So that's that doesn't come on a silver platter because it has been, you know, there's barriers that were built up. We're talking about critical reading and we're talking about education, but I think, you know, even, even when it comes to, um, to public education, we do have to talk seriously about academia and the autonomy in academia, which we see in Anna's example and in so many examples is also under serious attacks um, by these sort of tiny tyrants of the region and, and elsewhere too. Uh, how, do you, how do you see these models apply to academia or to public intellectuals, Boris, both from your example or structurally? Do you think that taking a conflict early is the way to go? Does that help? Or are you maybe concerned more for preserving institutions and maintaining a culture as a silent stream? Also, do you think that there is any model that can help um, that can help academia be less dependent from the state? Okay, I would say in Slovenia, uh, people from the university field so far are more or less keeping silent. Uh, personally, my position, I would say, uh, is very specific because I was active as a, let's say, media critic uh, uh, even before. Uh, I was despised by many authorities here in Slovenia even before. 
So uh, what uh, happens here right now is that, of course, the government is attacking uh, these uh, critical voices. Uh, uh, the government is trying to to um, compromise, to discredit personally people like like me. Uh, and the question is whether to get to yes to 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 get used to it or not to get used to it. Uh, this rhetoric is really hard to stop, and uh, such hate speech and personal attacks are becoming more and more uh, widespread in, in the civic sphere. Uh, on the other hand, I would say that there are many uh, cultural workers, intellectuals who are protesting right, right now in the streets, of course, because uh, they are suffering from the shutdown of all, let's say, private venues. Uh, there is a loss of income from the, say, cinemas, from the concert halls, from the theaters. So uh, there was a kind of uh, Corona aid uh, for self-employed uh, uh, cultural workers, and now it ended. So um, those people who usually receive support from the state, like publishers, like cultural workers, performance, and the like, they are, of course, under increasing uh, financial pressure. Uh, also, I would like to add that uh, there is a huge attack um, on NGOs here going on, uh, including Peace Institute. Uh, so those people are right now protesting against this threat of eviction from the state on building, there is approximately 20 NGOs who were in this state building and now they're being evicted. Uh, of course, this building is in the center of the capital Ljubljana and uh, uh, I would say that this will hugely affect uh, the future of NGOs and the art scene here in Slovenia. So uh, the Slovenian uh, government, the, the culture ministry is basically owning this building, so they are justifying the need for eviction by saying uh, they have to renovate the building. Um, the, next thing, the next thing I would like to stress is also that um, there is a critical moment for Slovenian filmmakers also. Uh, because they are not receiving funds uh, for various films, film projects here in Slovenia. So many of them are waiting uh, for the payments for their work uh, uh, that was already done a year ago or something. So uh, these projects have been stopped right now or postponed or are basically endangered. So um of course because of the covid-19 crisis and pandemic this field of film and cinematography here in slovenia is getting worse and worse and uh i mean all cultural people workers and intellectuals who are uh drawing funds from the state budget are now endangered so um uh that, that's the reason why basically intellectuals and cultural workers are right now uh, protesting, protesting in the streets. Uh, this is uh, done weekly. I mean, every Friday there is a huge gathering uh, in the streets of Ljubljana and other cities throughout Slovenia. There are normally several thousand people. There were 27 protests uh, by now. So uh, in this four, uh, in this seven months, that would be that that would mean that each, each week uh, there is a one uh, one of the protests in in the streets. There's further reading also on Slovenia, um, and the situation in Slovenia uh, suggested by Boris down in the description below and by all of the speakers here. Also, if you're interested how culture workers were drawn out and got 
engaged in the protests in Belarus. Ingo Petz just recently published his piece in your zine, um, which you will find in headline, but also in the description. So maybe that's, that's a sort of slower process for people to get involved and take issue than those who are quick to do it can accept or can can count on. I'm also sometimes referring to myself because I first met Andres when I was the activist and you you were looking into who's organizing protests. Um, I do understand Anna's point because I'm a big ball of anger, so I can take issue with anything straight up and then just realize maybe it wasn't the right time. But you are not the kind of person who confronts up front, right? Uh, so you are you have not been involved in political activism on any sort of side. You keep yourself to this very sort of, let's say, industry standard journalism median. So how do you decide on a point when you actually take up a conflict and take issue or re openly resist something? And where is the point where you say that you're just standing your ground, staying there doing the work, and that should be enough? So what is the breaking point? How do you make a decision like that? Well, uh, it's very easy because I, I don't de take this decision. I always try to be independent journalist and work as an independent journalist. That means I, I'm not taking sides and I haven't been done and none of my colleagues done it. I think that uh, gives us the strength, uh, what, what is really needed, especially in Hungary now when uh, government tries to push journalists and medias into one side. And uh, so, well, it's, it's an interesting thing. Uh, I believe Hungarian government doesn't want to have only right-wing media. Uh, it's it's uh, something important for them and for the propaganda to have a, a very obvious uh, opposition media uh, that, uh, you know, tells slogans they can fight with. So that's why our media index that age you that doesn't really exist in its form anymore was dangerous for the government because we kept these standards which, me, which meant they could not push us uh, to the box of opposition media or left liberals or whatsoever, because we, we criticized uh, the previous, uh, for example, the, the socialist government that was uh, way before uh, Fidesz. And that's why we had uh, readers from every political side and that was a danger, danger for them. And uh, our power comes from independency. So we didn't uh, take, the, we haven't done this decision. And I try not to, to, to take this step. Well, in a sense, you did. I mean, you did. There was a mass resignation at index.hu. Um, and but then it, you founded Telex. So that's, that's a very open statement not about a political affiliation, but about a boundary that you're not willing to cross or trespass, right? No, 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 it's, it's the boundary of being independent. Yeah, but how, how, we, do, you, we, we how do you find we that, that boundary? Where, what, what is the basis of the judgment? Yeah, well, uh, it was also very uh, easy to, to see this boundary, but it, it was not between being an activist or being independent. It was, it was being, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, not being, being political sides or, or step out of, of being journalist. It was, we were pushed, we were in a situation when, uh, you know, unknown forces try to push us into one direction. And we said, no, we won't we won't be pushed or we, want, we, we don't want to be pushed in either direction. We want to be independent. And this boundary where we stood up was very, uh, very easy to, to uh, point out because we had uh, two principles for our work. Uh, and it was like also published that uh, our independency is depending on 
on the fact that we can produce our content or articles and videos and so on independently without any political or economical pressure. And uh, also that the content of our stuff uh, should not be changed without or notice and without or or um, uh, knowledge and uh, we stood up after our editor in chief was fired uh, by by the leader of of yeah, well, the, the, the initial conflict which led to this was originally that the idea was to break up the editorial staff into separate contractors and so that the editorial staff as a unit what have not existed anymore. Yes, yes, but uh, but uh, we we resisted this idea, so this idea was kind of cancelled. But right after that, our editor in chief was fired, and yeah. we said, uh, "Okay, this was the point because because we said uh, that uh, you know the the stuff cannot be changed." without our notice, and we didn't know anything about this, this step. It, we just uh, um, realized this step, or we were, we were informed what, uh, that uh, Sabolj tool uh, was fired. And then we said, OK, uh, we, have, we have one choice, either or, or you know, or or the, the the leaders of the company have have uh, one choice to reinstate him into his position, or we leave because this was a very strict rule for us, yeah. and they they um, they didn't want to uh, put him back into his position. So the next day we left uh, the the company. Sure, but in a sense, let's say that it, it is a bit similar to sort of waiting for an ultimate trigger. You didn't run ahead um, with assumptions. You waited until something so drastic was openly provable, pretty much unlike the staff of back then SME, which then founded Denik N, who didn't wait for this direct interference. You saw the change in ownership and left immediately, Lukash. So how is, how is this a very different trigger? Can you imagine a situation in which you would have waited? Or is it just, you know, is it, is it a, a personal choice that's different? Or is it an entirely different strategy that you chose? How, how do you see this? Well, first of all, you know, it's very uh, difficult to, you know, reconstruct events even after six years, uh, especially events uh, concerning large uh, groups of people. So I can, I, I will try to speak mainly for myself in this. I don't remember that as being, that situation as being a clear cut uh, situation at all. So there was a lot of um, uh, soul searching and uh, deliberation uh, just uh, on a personal level as to, how to uh, you know proceed in that situation because what I um, uh, I think there uh, you do have situations when the boundaries are very clear and when they're crossed they're crossed but I think there are very many processes where the boundaries are very blurred and sort of you just get from one degree of gray to to a different one and sometimes it's very difficult to, to draw the line and to to say that this is this is uh, for me the boundaries and and for me uh, that situation was uh, was in that category i mean it was uh, about you know thinking about where will this lead eventually and uh, is it better to act now or act later and uh, are these people the types of people that I want to be associated with in any uh, way, regardless of their interference uh, into my work or my life? So there are many arguments that uh, came up in that deliber deliberation and the process now to say not about, uh, only about my decision making, but, you know, it, it wasn't like a group action. It was like a, like a set of individual decisions that ended up looking from the outside as a mass a sort of decision or process. And for sure, there was a, a sort of some sort of a group dynamic going on, which I think we got to understand or partially or perceive 
only in retrospect. So it, it was the kind of thing where I, when, where I said, told my immediate colleagues that at the time I was one of the deputy editor in chiefs. And we sort of sat down and, and each of us on his own said that, okay, yeah, this is it, I'm, I'm leaving. And, and I, maybe the the arguments and the ways that led us to, to that decision were different. Obviously, there were many different factors, but sort of there at that point, there was like not even much of a debate. That was like a two minute <laughs> thing where, where, where everybody said in terms of the of the of the management or of the the editor in chief and the deputies of so saying okay we're leaving and we had no at that point no ambition to organize any sort of a mass thing uh so we just told the rest of the, the newsroom like okay this is uh, our decision if this goes through we're leaving and uh, you know we wish you all the best of luck we had since this was even for us a tough decision to make i think i i've, I've can say for my, myself, I had no ambition at all to, you know, convince anyone of, of that this is like the only way to go. And I, and uh, as was said previously, you know, people have children, people have uh, all sorts of commitments. So I, I, I wouldn't want to be in, and I, I hope I wasn't, you know, pretending to have uh, all the right answers or to pass any sort of moral judgments of people that decided differently in that situation. As it turned out, the the the, the, mad, the biggest number of, of, of our colleagues at that point decided in the same way then. And at that point only we realized, okay, that this is there is some sort of a mass movement going on and for sure we have some sort of a responsibility for what's going on. And only at that point did we start to have discussions about, okay, well, we have to, you know, take a next step. Because if it was only like the four or five of us, I think we all would have gone in our separate directions and done our thing or something. But suddenly, I mean, the, the sense of responsibility for a, a group of 50 people that that will be out of a job uh, and that have their children and their mortgages and, and, and all of that, that sort of motivated us uh, um, to to come up with a plan, and we did uh, in a, in a very short time, and and that's how Den again was started. So that was the process. The process. So I will not pretend it was uh, very structured or premeditated, or or that we knew from the beginning where all of this was heading. It was, uh, and. and uh, Quite honestly, I think many uh, big and small historical events work in this way of just, uh, you know, people making their own small de de uh, decisions and one one thing le leading to the other. And suddenly you have something that hopefully is making an impact in terms of at least uh, our country and maybe maybe even the region. So you're saying that this wasn't um, sort of pre-planned strategy, but more a chain reaction in which time and and moving together had a huge factor, right? Andres is, is, has been really, uh, you know, nodding here while you were talking. I think he relates to this very closely. Yeah, it was the same for us. So when, when well, um, it was different uh, on the on the personal level because we we decided together. So there were a lot of discussion what to do now, but it was obvious that, uh, that fundamental, uh, things has, has changed. So boundaries has been crossed and we have to, uh, react and we, we cannot accept this anymore. So we, we live through those, those, uh, times when, you know, different times of different, uh, uh types of grays appeared around us. But we have these two principles and we, we thought if these are kept, we can work to, uh, we can work, work on because then we can publish our material without any uh, interference and we know who we are work with. But then, you know, one of these, these principles have been uh, dismissed and, uh, um, and then we we knew that we have to do something, and then we had like really hated uh, heated conversations within the editor editorial room. That actually I was filmed and and uh, I just uh, watched these these footages lately, and these were quite interesting times I would say. And then we decide 
together that, okay, we leave, but we didn't have any plan back then what to do. So we, we knew only that we, we have to leave, we have to stop working here because we, we, we cannot work uh, anymore uh, here as an independent journalist because then we have to do, you know, those uh, uh, little um, step backs that we didn't want to do. And then uh, maybe the next day or that day, uh, a huge organize, uh, a huge demonstration was um, uh, organized. I, uh, we didn't support. organize. I'm sorry. In your support. Yeah, in our support, and and uh, a crew, crowd of like ten thousand people woke up to the office of uh, Viktor Orban, and uh, it was a, a demonstration for Index. And then we felt, wow, uh, we really have a huge support and we should do something. And I think this, this was a, a, a big um, emotional help to, to step on. And then we started to think about our next step. And uh, well, we, we had ideas, of course, uh, when we when we uh, left the company that we should start something but it was really like a science fiction you know in Hungary I really uh, agree with Anna Lengel that uh, that uh, Hungarians are not really you know revolution hard to engage hard, hard to engage yeah I would say. exactly so so we we didn't think much about, about, uh, you know, starting a new, uh, new media out of scratch. But then we felt that, uh, that's something, uh, that we have a huge support and we, we, sh we should start something. And then, uh, uh, the process has started and now You've been running uh, for a month now. Yeah, we have been working for a month. One of my article is just about to publish. So that's why I was like pushing my phone <laughs> while filming because, uh, because, you know, the process is going on. So it's, uh, it's really a, a, a positive outcome. Although this is an experiment in Hungary. So we, we still don't know if we can operate as Genyik, or we have to find out uh, some other uh, structure. And uh, we also have uh, a mission, you know, like uh, Index worked as a, some kind of uh, public media, because uh, the Hungarian public media doesn't f fulfill it, yeah. it, it, its tasks. But it's, uh, it's a question how we can do it if we are working or if we will work uh, behind pain voice. So there's a lot of question, but uh, well, we, we are at a posi positive uh, stage now. Well, I think we can all acknowledge that if you have to st substitute public service because the official public service doesn't do its job, it's always going to be partial because that's a structural thing. Um, and probably we will also at some point have to talk about what actually constitutes public service beside, you know, the given channel here and there, um, or whether that's a task for, for commercial media. You can guess my answer, but that's beside the point. So I do have to say that I'm very disappointed that Lukash says he doesn't have all the answers. He has a PhD in logic, so I would have expected something more. But even no. if you don't have all of the answers, uh, I'm pretty sure you do have a bunch. So let's now switch to video conference mode, all of us, and see what questions and comments the audience has for us. Eurozine is based on, on collaboration and syndication within our network of culture journals. And of course, this is both the strengths and the mission of the network. 
Uh, Vox Europe also publishes in multiple languages and they have introduced a new feature which I want to jump out to just say a few words about because apparently some people are experimenting with um, not, a, not a paywall for the users but entirely the other way around. Gianpaolo, take it away, please. Yeah. Thank you, Rekha. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to um, talk here. I hope you can uh, because uh, there are some funny noises in my headset. Um, yeah, we, we've been introducing, um, a, it's not really a paywall, but it's a membership, uh, as we call it. Um, in uh, May, probably the, the worst moment to, to set up this kind of operation uh, this year. But anyway, it, it was planned earlier and we set it up uh, in May, along with the Steady platform, which is a German-based uh, platform for membership and subscriptions. And we are rather happy. Now, the, the most difficult part for us is to find what we would like to keep for our members. What we, we want to uh, to keep free for our readers, and also um, when does the paywall? Uh, when is the paywall lifted? Uh, after how many days? So we first decided two, then four, then probably a bit longer, uh, only for exclusive content. Uh, it's all about fine tuning, and um, I find very inspiring uh, what I've been listening to now because I, I have to think that if stakes are high subscribers come in uh, rather uh, easily uh, as, as we saw with uh, Genic especially and now I hope also with um, Telex and I also see that at Eurozine you've been introduced a kind of um, supporting membership I would be curious to to hear how it is uh, how it is uh, doing, um, but I'm here more to listen uh, than to than to talk. But I would be happy to, uh, to to talk more if needed. Sure, I don't have a lot to report on yours inside. We are asking for uh, donations from our audience, but this is not something that we so far have put a huge emphasis on. Mm. At this point, we are, um, we are co-financed or, or mainly financed from grant projects, and some of it is public funding. So our logic here is that once we get public funding, what we do is supposed to be free. Um, but that's, um, that's a rationale that doesn't apply to everyone who is publishing. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, extend this over everyone. But I think we're not not necessarily the most relevant player here. And you have um, asked a bunch of questions here, I believe. So um, you asked in the chat whether the speakers have the impression that their fellow colleagues, journalists, academics, and theater directors in other European countries are aware of the situation of press and culture in Hungary, Slovenia, and Slovakia, and uh, whether they think that it would be useful if they were uh, if they were more vocal within their country and did not see the abuses by the government, or is there something more or different they could do to help? And would that even be an appropriate way? This is Gianpaolo's question to the panelists. What do you think? Do you think that your international colleagues should be more vocal? Um, and would that help your situation? Maybe we can start with Anna and then go in an alphabetical order of uh, names. So first I need to um, maybe explain that I'm sitting um, in a hospital. I'm getting a blood transfusion because my blood platelets, platelets are low. I have cancer and I'm waiting for my next uh, chemo. But first I have to get blood to be able to get it. But I'm doing fine. So no worries. But that's uh, the reason for the weird setting. So um, for theatre makers, um, I think we have uh, an advantage because uh, these are um, known names uh, and uh, it's very easy and also they are creative people. So, for instance, the university uh, Scotters, um, uh, the University of uh, Theatre and Film Arts in Budapest, have all kinds of are studying all kinds of uh, different uh, creative professions and the lecturers are 
experts in those professions. So obviously there were many very creative ideas on how to get the word out. And then of course, the fact that I, I will just say an example, that I had worked with uh, Kate Blanchett um, several times uh, that made it very easy to have her um, um, have our motto on her palm in no time while uh, uh, chairing the jury in, at the Venice Film Festival. So I think it's, um, for instance, about the theatre, but mostly about the theatre school. Um, most European colleagues are are very aware. There was a huge support. There it still is huge support coming, and in fact. Uh, because this um, government and these uh, um, these arrogant um, uh, new so-called bosses who we refuse to acknowledge, uh, who we consider illegitimate, um, are trying to take our semester away. So they are saying now that uh, no one will get credits for this semester, even though the studying and the teaching went on the whole time. So we are now talking about uh, that as well with international schools, whether there is a way for them to help us in that respect. And uh, it's very promising. So in this respect, I think I think um, theater makers are fairly faring fairly well. Um, do you have international support or do you um, do you see institutions in Slovenia getting international support from coverage and does that does that help? Well, I, I would say that unfortunately I cannot see any such a support um, and and it would be nice to have one. Uh, so, uh, all that I can say is that the situation here uh, in Slovenia is dramatically bad uh, and very difficult. So, uh, cultural workers all around, I think they are in a huge crisis without any financial support from the state. Uh, so, they are just trying to search their, way, their ways how to survive in the marketplace. And uh, there is really uh, uh, no big future in it, I would say. So what we need is basically a kind of political change, instant political change. Uh, what we need, I would say, is a kind, a sort of uh, grassroots movement, uh, because our opposition is obviously very, very weak. So. What is going on right now is basically protests. There has been uh, more than 400 protests in half a year so far in the Slovenian streets. So people, protesters, NGOs are very much engaged uh, in defending human rights, uh, in defending independent cultural production, media freedom, and of course they are targeted by, by, by the government all the time, by, by hostile rhetoric, by police, and so on. So, no, uh, we really need a kind of internationalization of, of the situation, not only here in Slovenia, of course, but also here in Slovenia. I think it's very, very difficult right now. Obviously, there's a lot of international coverage in Hungarian media all over the place. It's sort of the, the yammer topic for anyone who wants to um, signal their, um, their liberal democratic values, um, and for others who genuinely worry too. Does this help, Ash? Does this interfere with your work? Does it have an actual effect on you? So, well, uh, the international attention doesn't really help us here in Hungary, uh, especially because Hungarian readers tend to read Hungarian newspapers. So we don't think that uh, the international attention uh, gives us uh, a lot of support here in, um, in Hungary. Uh, but uh, it might be important from government wise that they know that uh, there's such some some kind of attention on us and uh, they might know that they can can't do anything at least not while the spotlight is on us uh, 
and we we got some uh, some advices and help from from different media from from example Genik helped us a lot so i know or uh, uh, you know the founders and the 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 leaders of, of our new company, Telex, visited uh, Genik and uh, had a lot of doubtful uh, conversation with them. So we, we might use their experiences. Uh, but, uh, you know, in Hungary, especially the uh, this uh, liberal or, or leftist part of the society thinks that uh, international support can can help us or or european the european union or or you know the the attention of the international community can uh, pressure our, our government but uh, we i think we had to realize that uh, this is just a, a hope and our government uh, is not or never never been stopped by being watched by uh, the, the international or European community. So it was nice to 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 read uh, articles on our struggle, but I don't think it it uh, was it it give it gave us more than emotional support. I see. I understand. It also corresponds to what um, what Anna talked about in the recording that there's no salvation coming from outside, right? Yeah. Uh, Lukash, do you want to comment on on coverage on Slovakia? Well, I I have several thoughts on that. I mean, firstly, luckily, I mean, we're currently in a position where uh, you know the situation is not as dramatic, so. We're, we're, I think um, we're all happy to let the attention uh, be on, on, on those that need it uh, more. The, my second thought would be that, uh, you know, all, all of these, all of our countries have their problems. But if we look at countries such as Belarus or Russia, uh, you know, not to mention countries even further away, I mean, the problems get even bigger and naturally, you know, there is there are only so many topics that international attention, um, whatever that means, uh, can can focus on. So naturally, I mean, I think Belarus is currently the country which, which is getting the the most attention, and and probably rightly so. And then I would say our experience with international influence, I think, in Slovakia is mixed. I think there for sure in the nineties when we had our, our biggest flirtation with autocracy and maybe really, um, you know, we're not on, on, on our way to NATO and EU uh, membership, but it seemed as though we might be going, you know, uh, the Ukrainian or, or Belarusian way. Now, I think at that point, um, the international pressure and also help uh, helped the country a lot. I mean, for sure, the the change eventually had to be domestic and had to be done, you know, by Slovaks, and so it, it couldn't be imposed on us. But I think it did help that we were not uh, forgotten and we were helped. Naturally, that was in a somewhat uh, different um, international and geopolitical and histor historical context. For sure, the. Uh, the perspective of EU membership was something that was very highly motivational, but that can no longer be used since our countries are, are already members and are, you know, contributing in our own strange ways to, <laughs> to the, to to what the what the EU currently looks like. So I understand that uh, the situation is now different, but we do have this one positive experience. But I would also mention a negative experience. I think. A large portion of the Slovak media market expected that foreign media ownership would be something that in the long run would guarantee independence of the local media and, and uh, media freedom. And for, for maybe a decade after the 90s ended and really Slovakia joined the EU and so on, that seemed to be the case. I mean, slowly the big media all 
uh, were being were owned uh, uh, by by large foreign investors who really did bring their know-how and really had no local business or political interests. So really, uh, we're creating an, an environment in which um, you know journalists could do their their work uh, well. But after the financial crisis hit in 2008, was it maybe? Uh, we, we saw a huge reversal of all that and basically all the big foreign owners started selling and sadly most of them sold to whoever, whoever was offering the most, which was in, in most instances uh, the oligarchs and people who had other than just purely business in, interest in, in owning a media company because at that point having a media company was not that great of a, of a business in, in most instances. So. At least as far as Slovakia and the Czech Republic is concerned, I think there, there, that was a moment of sort of like uh, like a sobering moment or, or, or a time when, when people woke up a little bit to the reality that maybe even the West as we perceived it maybe is not a guarantee or a solution to all the problems we may have. And then that, that in the long run, as was mentioned previously, it's it's in the end, it's up to us to make sure that uh, our institutions are, are functional and that independence and free speech are, are you know, successful. Well, this is something that comes up a lot in conversation also with the um, with the Western Balkan countries who are waiting for accession or applying for accession to the EU. The countries seem to be on their best democratic behavior until they're actually in the club. Um, although that's also, you know, that's a perception. Uh, I'm not sure that that applies. Um, but it does come up a lot in conversation. Now we have Irena Mariniak back on the screen. Irena, would you care to ask your question? Hi. Um, you wanted to address on Valencia. Yeah, I did. Um, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I, I'm just really interested in this educational side of things that, that Anna mentioned. Um, in the recorded conversation. Um, I mean, it does seem key to me. And, and I was wondering how easy it is at the moment for, for someone like you, Anna, or for anyone to, to walk into a school and, and, um, and try and do a session on freedom of expression. Um, because, I mean, if it were possible to do this, um, this would obviously have a huge impact and um, would have a, a sort of further effect um, on, on higher education and so on and so on. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you. Well, there are a lot of um, theatre and education programmes because this, this would be fall under that category. And there are actually uh, th uh, two... Um, very successful um, over 20 year old theater and education groups and uh, recently there has been an immense amount of uh, funding for theater and education in fact uh, i don't think any other theater activity um, has been funded that well in the past uh, 10 years or so so that uh, so and and of course there are some companies which only do that but then again uh, every theater uh, has a theater and education program. If I want to be a, a little cynical, I could say uh, in some cases, maybe really just uh, because that's where the money is, but uh, mostly they are really good programs. And these programs are very comprehensive. There are many forms and uh, some forms include going to the school. Other forms include the theater, the, the school groups going to the theater. And uh, it's usually not, um, I'm sorry, I forget how exactly you formulated it. It's um, not the, a, yeah, a session. It's not a session on freedom of speech. It's much rather, um, you know, either it can be a full play uh, where you do this stop and go thing. I don't know if you are familiar with it, but that, you know, you have the show and then you stop it at a, a certain point and you ask the students uh, to react or to jump in instead of one of the performers and, and act out what they think uh, they should do or different options that they could do. 
that's a, that's a very exciting uh, genre and it takes a lot of uh, preparation, but it's uh, very rewarding and infinitely complex. Uh, but even when going to the schools, there are um, usually there are, you know, very carefully designed um, um, workshops. Or, so it's not just a, Maybe it's a session, you're right, maybe that's the right word too, but it's never like a, you know, a speech or just a talk uh, or a discussion, but it uses all the theatre forms. Yeah, so this, this is a question uh, mainly for, for Andras um, uh, and Luca. This in the, you, talk, you talked a lot about the objectivity issue, so, uh, and particularly Andras, you know, how uh, you know, the, your neutrality, the neutrality was the uh, a way to sort of almost protect yourself as a way of, you know, uh, justifying your existence and, and, and keeping the, you know, the authorities at a distance. Um, and then I think you hinted towards the end that, that well, now you've changed with, with Telex to a, to a subscription model that, you know, this, this principle uh, might not be sustainable. Um, and my question is really, and this is really to both of you, is, is, you know, are you finding that once one enters a kind of subscription type of uh, a system or a model, of, uh, then does one's um, approach to the question of uh, political neutrality, i.e. This, you know, this, this journalistic kind of standard, does that change at all? Uh, or are you finding, you know, the opposite, that people... Um, are coming to you and subscribing precisely because uh, they aren't getting, you know, this kind of uh, neutral coverage anywhere else. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, uh, thank you for the question. And maybe I wasn't clear enough uh, previously, so I didn't question the the role of neutrality, and I didn't think or uh, I didn't want to uh, say that uh, we have to change this. Uh, uh, attitude. Uh, so, well, uh, political neutrality is is very important uh, to be a journalist, and it's very important uh, in Hungary nowadays, especially in these in these circumstances when all the news or most of the news can be uh, identified as left. Uh, as, as as someone who writes from the from the position of the opposition parties or from the government, and people uh, feel that they don't get the news, they get you know political agendas uh, through uh, the, the the news and through articles and videos and so on and in this in this situation uh, political neutrality or or to be independent as i i would say is is extremely important and that that gives us all credit or credibility so i think that could be our strength or or um, or value uh, for the for our readers that okay they know these are the, the publications. These 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 are the media of the opposition. These are the media of the of the government. You know these are this big and this small, but whatsoever, whatever. And uh, there there's uh, quite a big need for for a neutral or to or a an independent uh, uh, publication. Well, um, it's just a side note that uh, to be neutral politically, it doesn't mean that you don't have your values that you are stand for. So uh, I wouldn't say we are neutral like, you know, in the science should be. So for example, we, we believe, you know, in human rights, or we believe freedom of speech, we believe in democracy, and a lot of things that are values, and we are very transparent on that on those. But uh, we don't want to, you know, uh, be a, a mouthpiece of any political uh, organization or or political side. And yeah, we we believe that to be neutral 
and to to be independent is extremely important for telex for our new publication Mm, yes, as Andras indicated, I mean, the first part of this debate is about what it really means to be neutral, you know. I mean, you now have people that believe that the Earth is flat, that, you know, the Holocaust is a made-up thing. And, uh, you know, and you have political uh, currents that represent these opinions. And now, do you want to be neutral in the debate about whether the Holocaust was a, is, is made up, you know? Because some will say, well, if you don't give equal space to both sides of the debate or whatever, you're not naturally neutral, you're, you know, biased and that, all, all, all of that. Plus, I would, you know, say that, speaking for Slovakia, currently the former uh, po police president is in jail. The former special prosecutor, whose role it was to, you know, prosecute corruption, is in jail. A deputy justice um, minister, whatever, is in jail. And they're, all of them are there uh, for a reason, you know. And previously, when uh, the media was uh, questioning their steps or whatever, they were exactly saying, well, but you're not being neutral, you're not, not giving us a fair chance or whatever. And time has shown that maybe there was a reason why they, they were not given that chance or, or, if, or from certain from a certain point, they were being, you know, consistently questioned and not being treated completely neutrally. So firstly, it's a very tough debate about what it is, uh, what it means being neutral. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a tough debate, even globally, you know, with, with, a, um, if you if you see how much space you know the uh, all the hoaxes and all of that gets globally, I think the, the, there is now a big debate going on globally about whether you should really give all sides uh, a fair hearing and present everything neutrally. I mean, because obviously it seems to be leading to chaos in, in very many instances, and especially in the context of what you what we could still you know call not fully democratic countries or not uh, fully westernized, it, it gets even much, much, much more complicated. So that's like the first tough part of, of whatever you're asking. The second, and but on top of that, I would say that what subscription does, it, it, it rewards quality, at least from what we found. I mean, really, it's a, the exact opposite of what clickbait does. I mean, because you're not rewarded, you're not uh, motivated to do something that satisfies a quick uh, urge or, 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 or you know but but really you have to come up with a product that sells in the end so most of our subscribers are generated by really by hitting a hard paywall and just wanting to finish the article and that only happens with articles that bring high added value so we we really keep very detailed statistics on our conversions and everything and mostly there are exceptions but generally speaking the same articles that an independent panel of journalistic experts would say bring the highest added value are the ones that sell uh, the best and, and have the biggest commercial. So in that respect, the subscription model is, is, uh, is a force for, for, for the improvement of quality of journalism, I would say. I, I understand it doesn't completely answer the question of neutrality, maybe, but... Um, uh, in in some ways, it, it it does. Perhaps it's perhaps it's better to frame it not as neutrality, because I, I I completely grasped your argument, so it makes total sense. Perhaps, but uh, in terms of plurality and whether um, you know whether one when one moves to a subscription model, one is one is has a has a set of shall we say you know has an audience um, that is there in order to um, read and uh, hear uh, about the kind of things that they want to hear. So uh, I think this is a problem, or not, no, it might not be a problem, but it's certainly a, a, a fact or a, or a phenomenon that we, we see, um, you know, across the board um, when, 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 uh, you know, the advertising model moves perhaps towards a, a more kind of, uh, sort of a donor-based model. I think just if I can add very quickly, I think it's the situation is much different in small countries that do not operate on a global scale. Again, for an English, for large English speaking media that operate on, on big markets such as the US market or the British market, obviously you're gonna going to see, you know, uh, 
a, a huge degree of differentiation between the various media. I mean, you have a medium for the for the conservative reader, for the liberal reader, uh, reader uh, or whatever, and the divide between the values and opinions of those readers can get uh, pretty extreme. But again, Slovakia is a country of five million, so if you want to uh, you want to survive, you can't really just focus on on a very niche uh, <laughs> group because you're not going to survive. And overall, the market is not strong enough to allow that sort of differentiation as in the US, you know, it, it works in a completely different way uh, with with small countries that have, you know, again, a, a very limited number of, of, of speakers of that language in which you're, you know, um, doing your, your journalism. So I think it's not quite the same, quite the same situation here as, as you would see in, in the English speaking world and, and, and especially in the big countries. Thanks very much for your, for your answers. They were very interesting. Thanks. So this has been Simon Garnett, senior editor of Eurozine, uh, posing the question. And you heard Irena Mariniak before him, who is our contributing editor. And now let's move on to YouTube comments for the remaining few minutes. Um, 09QWE1 asks, Andras, when you index writers left the premises, what documents did you grab on the way out? What documents? <laughs> yes. I mean, I'm assuming you were smart enough to bring a, a souvenir. I'm so uh, souvenirs. Uh, well, uh, I don't know. Uh, well, I I grabbed my 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 notes that uh, that were valuable for for me and uh, my office stuff. Well, wish I could say anything interesting, but well, uh, you know, we 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 left the office quite in a de depressed mood. So so basically, we didn't really think about uh, bringing, you know, like memories or, or memorable. Um, uh, things with us, especially because we didn't know what we will do. So there was no plan in our minds that we will we will do a new medium or we will, we will work together uh, in the in the near future. So basically, or 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 departure or from the office was quite a, a sad um, uh, process and uh, and we didn't really think about uh, the near future that that is quite positive from that that perspective that we have a, a medium and we can work now and and uh, and so on but we left quite a lot of things there. So our office actually looked like a museum of things. You know, every journalist always gathered things and and brought to the office and and from the life vest from the Mediterranean until you know uh, secret documents uh, from the communist era and so on. These, these were all in, in piles in the editorial room. And I guess most of those been left there. Sure. If you're interested, such a, an anecdotic thing that I, I, I can add some, something like that. Yeah, um, I'm sorry, there's no juicy thing, like the hot water bottles or something. <laughs> I keep a lot of crazy things at the office, but <laughs> whatever, uh, a pair of slippers or something of the like. Uh, so um, another question, a lot of people ask whether this part is live. It is live, that's why it's such a horrible quality and that's exactly <laughs> yeah. why we pre-recorded most of the discussion so that you don't have to suffer through all the, are you here? Am I muted? All of these questions. <laughs> so um, that's a huge part there. And then Rika Sabo is writing, I believe she's writing from England that I would be interested about the political situation in Slovenia and in Slovakia regarding free journalism. I think you both have mentioned uh, details about these and we have also included further reads down in the description of the live stream, specifically for this reason. Um, Lukas um, 
included a link about a report from the region in terms of media oppression. However, Boris has signaled that he would be happy to answer this. Boris, would you take it away? Yes, if you can hear me, is it okay now? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, you can, right. Well, I would say the following. Um, this is the third mandate of Yanis Yansha, uh, namely Yansha succeeded uh, in becoming uh, prime minister in March this year. Uh, and I would say that in his last uh, 16 years, uh, he politically took over many media for at least some short period then setting up uh, his loyal editors and journalists. Uh, for example, in the biggest daily, Dela, here in Slovenia, then in Daily Večer, then uh, Primorska Novice, then in National Public Broadcaster as well, then in Slovenian Press Agency. And then he started uh, running two free newspapers, but for the last five years, he's promoting his own media published or, or being supplied by Viktor Orban's friends. So these media are directly financed by uh, Hungarian people, businessmen. Uh, and so the situation is that he has received about 2 million euros from Hungary for these media outlets. And what what he tries to do right, right now is, of course, to to take over also the our public uh, RTV, national public broadcaster as well, then Slovenian press agency. So he's just trying to repeat uh, this exercise. So, so um, we are just in the middle of these procedures, how to replace the members of the supervisory board um, in, in the RTV and uh, his uh, mission is obviously uh, the same all the time. So how to subjugate Slovene media. And uh, this is really depressing, I would say, and very much like the situation in Hungary. So what we are getting is really a kind of urbanization of free press here in Slovenia. I would love to live in a country where people who break the law end up in prison. So I was very jealous hearing of that because this, our country is a country of no consequences, as you know, so they never uh, end in prison. So that's already a great step. Thank you. And so I can just follow up, uh, follow up on that. It's a very new thing for, for Slovakia, an extremely new thing, and I don't know how long it will last, but our experience is that it can happen very fast, that even things that seemed impossible you know, then suddenly change from, from uh, week to week and month to month, and even, you know, I think uh, the Central Europe has a very long history of, of events turning uh, very fast. And I think sometimes it can be even for the better. So even for Hungary, I would be optimistic. I think that there is still a chance that things will turn around and suddenly, you know, in, in a few years, you, you, everything will be different. And, uh, you know, no dictatorship is forever. And I think Central Europe is still a place where democracy has a good chance of, of, of going through. So I would, um, I would like to wish all of you the best and, uh, if we can ever help in any way, we will be more than happy to, and let's, let's hope for the best. Okay, let's finish on that hopeful note, because I really don't want to lose that. Um, and anyway, thanks everyone for being here with us and taking the time. Thanks to the audience as well, as, and of course, um, most importantly, the URZ network members who joined us for this evening. Um, so this has been a discussion with uh, Lukas Fila from Denik N from Slovakia, Andres Ferdes from Telex in Hungary, Anna Lengel of Panodrama in Hungary, and Boris Veziak from the University of Maribor in Slovenia. Um, thanks for your attention, and we will be back continuing the conference program in small um, iterations in February, because apparently there's a lot to talk about. Um, media freedom in the region and structurally. 
in general. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Köszönjük a figyelmet, ez volt az Eurozin idei konferenciájának az előfutára, mert az idei konferencia többi része jövőre van halasztva. Csatlakozzanak hozzánk február 26-án és 27-én is, ahol szintén Budapestről, ugyanezekkel a partnerekkel igen kiterjedt programmal fogunk jelentkezni, elsősorban médiaszabadságról, független újságírásról, kisebbségi reprezentációról, és arról, hogy mit csinál az, aki halálos fenyegetést kap, de mégse akar halálos félelemben élni, miközben a szakmáját gyakorolja. Köszönjük a figyelmet! Thanks for watching this conversation from the 31st European Meeting of Cultural Journals, streamed from Budapest on the 14th of November 2020. There's more. Click on the card above to watch another panel discussion on media freedom and self-censorship in Central and Eastern Europe. Subscribe to the Eurozine newsletter and Gogarin, the Eurozine podcast. You'll find the links in the description. Eurozine, we help you cut through the noise and make sense of things.